Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one, you huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches, back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog Yukon King as they meet... The Challenge of the Yukon. Stop! Look! Listen! Here's a warning! Nutrition authorities say breakfast should provide from one quarter to one third of the day's total food requirements. Don't let breakfast be the forgotten meal in your home. According to authorities, you can't go wrong if you eat plenty of cereal, fruit, milk, and bread. So tomorrow, enjoy a delicious bowlful of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice topped with milk and fruit. For added health benefits, natural grade amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron are restored in Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Try this easy-to-serve, thrifty family breakfast tomorrow. King was in disgrace. He was confined to a run in back of the Northwest Mounted Headquarters in Dawson. And although he could have scaled the high fence, his master had told him that he must stay in the run. And his master's word was law. The sergeant wasn't angry with him. When he brought him his food, he'd pat him and talk to him, and his voice was kind. It's a shame, King. Human beings are allowed to make a mistake now and then. People understand it. But evidently, that doesn't apply to dogs. It isn't as if you actually hurt Faraday, except in his dignity. It's the most important part of him, though. That's what made him so vindictive. I'm sorry, boy. King didn't understand what he had done that was wrong. The man with the red hair was his master's enemy. Why didn't the sergeant realize it? Why didn't the sergeant remember? King remembered. It had happened a long time ago. The sergeant called out to King to stop in front of the cabin in the clearing. Oh, King! Hey, husband! Oh, no. We'll see if our man's come this way, King. Come in! As the door opened, a shot rang out. The sergeant dropped to the floor. The man with the red hair rose from behind the table, a gun in his hand. And King leaped over the table and knocked him to the floor. King's jaws closed on the wrist of the man's gun hand. He started to shake it. Come quick, get this dog off me. King could hear someone behind him, but he couldn't release the wrist until the gun had been dropped. A sharp, terrible pain, and then blackness. When King opened his eyes, his master was no longer lying in the doorway. But he knew that he was still in the cabin in the room beyond. He crawled toward the open door. Now he could see the sergeant lying on a cot. A man was bending over him. Not the man with the red hair. A man he had never seen, but one he knew nevertheless. His scent told King this was the man who had struck him from behind. Oh, so you've come too, hmm? Better not try any more rough stuff, big boy. King didn't charge. He knew this man wasn't hurting his master... He was bandaging him in the same way the sergeant had often bandaged King. The dog crept close to the cot. You're a smart dog. Figure I'm doing your boss some good, hmm? <laughs> and I'm doing my best. I don't want any part of killing the Mountie. Oh. The sergeant opened his eyes and King licked his hand. Oh, hello, King. You're going to have to take it easy for a while, sergeant. But you're going to be all right. Bert Morton. Yep. You shoot me? Oh, sir. Didn't you see the man who shot you? I opened the door. Blood hit me. Well, I didn't do it. You know you're wanted for robbery in 40 Mile, don't you? Yes, but I didn't have anything to do with that either. Orders are to bring you in. That's all right. I've decided to give myself up. You're willing to come back to 40 Mile and stand trial? Yes, sir. 
The only evidence against me is that I was seen near the express office just before the robbery. I'll try to convince the jury I'm innocent. It's better than running away. You're sure you didn't shoot me? If I had, Sergeant. Do you think your dog would put up with my company for one minute? Uh, guess you wouldn't, King. <laughs> wonder who it was. I wasn't very far ahead of you. I heard the shot. You did? Yeah. I circled back through the woods just to see what was up. The door of the cabin was open. When I took a look inside, I saw you and King lying on the floor. Somebody hit him over the head. What about my team? There was no sign of one when I got here. Whoever shot you must have driven off with it. Well, I'll be able to follow the dog's trail. Well, I doubt it, Sergeant. You're hurt pretty bad. You won't be able to leave here for quite a while. You won't be able to move off that cot. I... Oh. Maybe you're right. I know I'm right, but it doesn't matter. I've got some supplies, and we'll get along till you're strong enough to travel. You're going to stay here? And take care of you, yeah. The Northwest Mounted Police are a suspicious breed of men, Bert. I don't blame you. Your suspicions are correct. I'm taking care of you because I think it'll help me at my trial. You're hoping for an acquittal. <laughs> of course. Then if you've cashed the money from the express company somewhere, you'd be free to go and get it afterwards. Look, I have no idea where the money is. Now, you better forget business for a while and try to sleep. That won't be hard. <laughs> King remembered the days of waiting in the cabin while a sergeant regained his strength. The trek back to 40 Mile. And then the day outside the courtroom when he saw the man who had taken care of the sergeant for the last time. Well, I lost, Sergeant. Your sentence was as light as it could be. Any sentence is too heavy for an innocent man. I still don't believe you're innocent. No? There was no one else who could have committed that robbery. But if you'd told us where the money was hidden, I think there'd have been a recommendation for mercy from the jail. I don't know where it is. Well, you may change your mind after a few months in jail. I can't. In that case, nothing to be said, but goodbye. Thanks again for saving my life. Ah, that's all right. You're a good guy. I will say, uh, I hear you found your dog team. Yes, a thousand miles from here in St. Michael. Whoever shot me is probably in the States by now. <laughs> There's life for you. The innocent go to jail and the guilty go free. It doesn't happen that way very often, Bert. And don't forget, the law has a long memory. That had been two years ago. The sergeant and King had worked on many cases since then, but King hadn't forgotten. And that was why he had disgraced himself a week ago. The sergeant and he were walking down the main street of Dawson. And then suddenly, in front of the Palace Hotel, King saw the man with the red hair. The man who had shot his master two years before. Get this dog off me. He's killing me. King, that's enough. Let him up. I said that's enough. What's the matter with you, boy? He's mad. That's what's the matter with him. Here, let me give you a hand, sir. You're not hurt, are you? Oh, look at my clothes. Just a little snow. It's an outrage. That dog must be shot. He's an officer of the law. I demand that you do it at once. There's nothing wrong with King. He's a menace. Fine thing when a respectable citizen can be attacked on the main street of Dawson by a wild animal. Either you shoot that dog at once or I go to your superiors. King's trained to help me in my work. He must have mistaken you for someone else. A criminal, perhaps. Well... My uh... name is Roger Faraday. And I represent one of the biggest mining syndicates in the Yukon. You've added insult to injury, Sergeant. And no apology can be accepted. That dog must be killed. King had been taken back to headquarters. And the only time he had left the run since then was on the afternoon the sergeant had attached a length of heavy chain to his harness and had led him into the inspector's office. The man with the red hair was sitting beside the inspector. Hello, King. Quiet, boy. Hear that, Inspector? He's vicious. If it weren't for that chain, he'd try to tear me limb from limb. I tell you, King never attacked anyone unless I've ordered him to. Did you order him to attack me? No, I didn't. There you are. He's gone mad. I won't stand for any sentimental nonsense, Inspector. I demand that he be done away with. King will not be shot. Thank you, Inspector. I'll go to Ottawa. I'll raise such a row in Parliament that the Northwest Mounted Police will be in trouble from the top man down. Mr. Faraday, King is a police dog, and he's been a good one. If Parliament should read his record, they'd end up by giving him medal. I'll fight you if you go to Parliament about this, and I'll win. We'll see about that. However, since there seems to have been no reason for King's attack, we'll place him under observation. What does that mean? The sergeant will see that he doesn't leave the run in back of headquarters. Well, 
What if I have to make a patrol, Inspector? For the time being, you'll have to do without him, Sergeant. I don't like it. For the time being. What does that mean? I insist that he never be allowed to run free on the trail or in town again. He won't be, Mr. Faraday. Until we're absolutely sure there's nothing wrong with him. That's all I have to say, and if you're not satisfied, it's your privilege to go to Ottawa. You'd better keep a close watch on him. Or it'll mean your job. Good day, sir. Quiet, boy. (laughs) And so King went back to the run. And even the sergeant's kind words couldn't reconcile him to the loss of his freedom. To the disgrace which he couldn't understand. (laughs) Sorry, King. Wasn't anything else the inspector could do, boy. But you've never acted that way before. There must have been a reason for it. I'm going to keep an eye on Mr. Faraday. We'll vindicate you if we can. We'll continue our story in just a moment. You know, fellas and girls, I was thinking about Halloween today and... Hey, what goes on here? Who are you? I say, who are you? I am a ghost. A ghost? Oh. My name's Pete, and I'm tired. Very tired. Oh, I thought you looked a bit pale. I've been busy lately. On the go, what with Halloween and haunting houses and things. Oh, I'll bet you're tired. I'm hungry, too. Real hungry. Haven't even had breakfast yet. What? No breakfast? Never do. Well, no wonder you look so thin. Well, I can hardly even see you. No offense, man, of course. Well, it's okay. Look, don't you know everyone, even ghosts, ought to eat a good breakfast? Oh? Sure. Well, never found a breakfast I really liked. Did you ever try a breakfast of Quaker-popped wheat or Quaker-popped rice topped with milk and fruit? No. Say, you don't know what you're missing. Swellest breakfast you ever tasted. Good for you, too. Man, oh, man, Quaker-popped wheat and Quaker-popped rice are crisp, tender, king size kernels of premium wheat or rice shot from guns. Mercy. Guns, did you say? Yep. Quaker-popped wheat and Quaker-popped rice are shot from guns to make them bigger and better tasting. Mm, that's a terrific idea. Why don't you try them? I'm going to. Now you're talking. And say, Pete, will we see you soon again? Afraid not. Not till next year around Halloween. But thanks for the tip. Gonna eat a good breakfast every day now. Gonna eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Goodbye. (laughs) Well, sir, fellas and girls, at least Pete the Ghost is on the right track. And don't you forget to stow away those delicious, nutritious breakfasts of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat topped with milk and fruit. Ask Mom to keep a good supply of both delicious kinds on hand at all times. You'll go for rice or wheat shot from guns. That's the original, the one and only, Quaker Puffed Rice and Quaker Puffed Wheat. Now to continue our story. Three days after Roger Faraday made his complaint concerning King, Bert Morton arrived in Dawson, and Sergeant Preston greeted him as he was checking in at the Palace Hotel. Hello, Bert. Well, hello, Sergeant. How are you? Fine, thanks. You seem to have survived pretty well. I've yeah, been out for two months now. Any plans? Oh. <laughs> What's funny? I know what you're thinking. I've come back to Yukon to pick up that stolen gold I cashed. Hmm? Well, if that isn't it, why are you here? I'm going to get a job. As soon as I have a grub steak, I'll go prospecting. Nothing wrong with that, is there? No, nothing at all. As long as you stay honest, I wish you the best luck in the world. Well, thanks. Be seeing you around, Bert. <laughs> I'll bet you will, Sergeant. <laughs> it was half an hour later that Bert knocked on Roger Faraday's door. Who's there? A friend. Bert. Surprised to see me? Of course I'm surprised. I didn't even know you were out. Come in and sit down. Thanks. Yeah, there. It was time off for good behavior. I'm glad to see you. Are you, Roger? You know I am. Everything's worked out fine, hasn't it? You finished your sentence. The 
Case is closed. Why, no one can touch either of us now. How do you figure that? Huh? You could still go to jail for your part in it. There's another little item of attempted murder. You're not threatening me, are you? I'm warning you that I hold a few aces. But we're not going to have any trouble. I'm ready to settle up with you. That's good. You can have your share of the gold tomorrow. I'll even do better than that. I'll give you 60% to make up for what you've been through and for keeping me out of it. Yes, sir, $1,800 the first thing in the morning. Roger, that isn't enough. Our agreement was 50-50. Right. When I decided to stay in that cabin and take care of the money, we agreed to a 50-50 partnership. Partnership, Roger. Not just an equal split of the gold. What are you suggesting? That you sign over half your share in the syndicate. Oh, that's absurd. The syndicate has nothing to do with our agreement. You went into it with my money? No, I didn't. As a matter of fact, I lost that in another mining deal. Don't lie to me, Roger. I've managed to keep track of you all the time. I know every move you've made while I was in prison. And you can't buy me off with $1,800 when my share should be something like $50,000. you are out of your mind. Either declare me in, or I take a walk down this street to the Northwest Mounted Headquarters. And if I do declare you in, what then? Everything's fine, just like you said. You'll leave the Yukon? Why should I? No, I'll stay here and keep my eye on my investment. You can figure out a job for me at one of the mines. Oh, that isn't a bad idea at that. Well, well, I can hardly believe it. Believe what? That you're giving in so easily. Ah. Ah, it doesn't take me long to make up my mind. And you're right. You do hold a couple of aces. So when do we sign the papers? I'll tell my lawyer to draw them up this afternoon. I'll sign them as soon as I get back from Boulder Creek. Why not before you go? Because I'm leaving tomorrow morning and they won't be ready. Why don't you come along with me, Bert? Boulder Creek might be the place for you to work. Yeah, don't mind if I do. Good. We'll leave as soon as it's light. But that night, Roger Faraday strolled into the Golden Horseshoe Cafe. He nodded to a couple of hard-featured men who were standing at the bar. They followed him to a booth in the back. He talked to the men for a short time, and then returned to his room. He packed for the trail, and his last move was to slip a small bottle into his parka. The following morning, when Sergeant Preston stopped in at the Palace Hotel, he learned that Bert Morton had left. He made other inquiries and then returned to headquarters and reported to the inspector. If you want to go after him, Sergeant, go right ahead. I will, sir. You uh, found out which trail he took? He was heading for Boulder Creek. But that's the opposite direction from 40 Mile. He couldn't possibly have cashed the gold there. I know, Inspector. It isn't the gold that interests me. It's the man he's traveling with. Who? An important and influential citizen by the name of Roger Faraday. What's the connection between those two? I suggest that you find out, Sergeant. I intend to, sir. And I have a hunch that what I find will be something that King's known all along. The sergeant harnessed his team, and King watched him from the adjoining runway. The great dog was silent, but there was a deep hurt in his eyes. His master was leaving him behind. Even when the sergeant was ready to start and came to King's runway for a final word of farewell, King only whimpered deep in his throat. Whatever his master did was right. I hope this is the last time I travel without you, King. Bye, fella. King burrowed in the snow. Misery and loneliness overwhelmed him. An hour passed, and then he raised his nose into the wind. It was starting to snow. In a heavy snow, Blackie might lose the trail without King to keep him in line. King began to pace back and forth. The snow continued to fall. The wind was increasing in violence. It was going to be a blizzard. Now a sure premonition of danger filled King, and with it came resolution. He growled. Then he leaped for the top of the fence. His claws rasped against the wire, but he was unable to pull himself over. He dropped to the ground. Now he called on all the strength of his great muscles and hurled himself at the barrier once more. A frantic effort, the top was reached. He was over. He hit the ground running. He followed the faint scent of the sergeant's team through the town and raced along the trail to Boulder Creek beyond until the scent of the team was fresh and he knew the sergeant was only a little way ahead. Then he slackened his pace, afraid that if his master saw him, he would be ordered to return. Somehow King knew the sergeant would need him. The trail wound through a woods, 
and when it emerged from the trees, it followed the edge of a deep ravine. He passed the remains of a campfire. Then he stopped short. There was a man down in the ravine. Without hesitation, King started down the steep slope, and at the bottom he found the man almost completely covered with snow. He was alive, but King knew that the bitter cold would soon force him to die. A sweet, sickening odor assailed King's sensitive nostrils. The sergeant must be told about this man, and forgetting his possible consequences, King scrambled to the top of the bank and set out along the trail at a dead run. Ten minutes later, he saw the sergeant, and the sergeant saw him. King, what's the meaning of this? What's come over you, boy? I've never known you to disobey me before. You have to go back, King. Back home. King understood the words, but he must make the sergeant come with him. He took his pocket in his teeth and pulled him back along the trail. I can't come with you, boy. What are you trying to tell me? King raced back along the trail for 50 feet and then turned, inviting his master to follow him. All right, King, I'll take your word for it. Up in front of the team. Get him turned around. Happily, King obeyed the command. And 15 minutes later, he led the sergeant down the side of the ravine to the man who was lying in the snow. Let's see. Bert Morton. What's that smell? He's been chloroformed, King. The sergeant lifted the unconscious man and carried him up the slope to his sled. He covered him with blankets and made a fire. Suddenly, the man on the sled screamed. No! No, don't do that. I'm, I'm smothering. I can't breathe. Easy there, easy. No! Hey, you're all right. No one's hurting you. You're all right, Bert. I'm Sergeant Preston, don't you know me? Oh, yeah. What happened? All I can tell you is you were chloroformed and thrown into the gully. Don't you remember what happened? No. You will. Just close your eyes and sleep for a little while. You're still groggy. When Bert opened his eyes once more, the sergeant had some hot coffee waiting for him. And when he had drunk a steaming cupful, he was able to tell his story. Just about here, I guess. We we saw these two men sitting by their campfire, and we drove up to them. When I stepped off the sled, Faraday told them to grab me. They did. I couldn't get away. And Faraday slapped a wet cloth over my nose. Mm, chloroform. When you were unconscious, they threw you into the gully and left you. Figured the cold would get you before you came to him. Just a killer. Faraday? I'm ready to tell you all about him, Sergeant. And the whole truth about me. Does it have something to do with that robbery in 40 Mile? Yeah. Hmm. Faraday was my partner on that job. We were both in that cabin when you caught up with us. He was the one who shot you. Come here, King. <laughs> Forgive me, fella. In my heart, I knew you couldn't do anything wrong. What's that? King recognized Faraday first time he saw him. He went for him, and Faraday wanted him shot. I can bet he did. Go on. What happened afterwards in the cabin? Well, I... I was the one who knocked King out. He's paid you back for that by yeah, saving your life. I know. I couldn't leave you to die, so... Faraday and I made a deal. He was to take your dogs and go on with the gold. I was to give myself up. And then afterwards, we were to split up the gold. We were to be partners. Which explains why he's trying to kill him. Yeah, you willing to testify against him in court? Absolutely. King suddenly leaped to his feet. The trail curved around a great pile of rocks a short distance ahead, and he knew there were men behind it. Get off that sled and dig down in the snow, Bert. What's the matter? Someone up on top of that pile of rocks. There it is. Come back. Maybe. I can see two men now. Keep down. Faraday and his strong arm boys. One of their arms isn't strong anymore. Hit him. One of them. The gunshots blasted the silence of the wilderness. The sergeant and Bert on lower ground, with only the sled for cover, were at a disadvantage. Down, Bert. But it had stopped snowing, and the sergeant's sure aim made it impossible for the men on top of the rock pile to get set for a shot. I'm sure those two were the men with Faraday, but I haven't seen him at all. Leaving us dirty work for somebody else. Only one of them's firing now. That sounds like a surrender. Come on, King. When the sergeant, King, and Burke reached the top of the rock pile, they found only two men. Both of them were badly wounded. I have a first aid kit here, Bert. We'll get them fixed up. Well, they don't deserve it. 
Well, I'll lend a hand. You! Is Faraday here with you? Yeah. We heard dogs. We come back to make sure nobody found Bert. When we saw you, Faraday ordered us to open fire. Where is he now? He took our team and left. Heading for Boulder Creek? Yeah, I, I guess so. We'll get him, King. Don't worry. As soon as the men's wounds had been bandaged, the sergeant gave Bert a gun, left the wounded men in his charge, and hit the trail. King was in the lead and happy once more, to be working and close to his master, no matter what the danger that lay ahead. He encouraged the team to travel faster and faster, and at last they rounded a curve and saw the team ahead. We're catching him, boy. Keep at it. Stop in the name of the law! Faraday's answer was to open fire. Instinctively, King began to weave back and forth, leading the team from one side of the trail to the other, making the flying sled as poor a target as possible. The sergeant held his fire until Faraday had emptied his gun. And then as he saw him hanging on with one hand and trying to reload with the other, he called out to King. Wait on, boy. We've got him now. King was working as a loose lead to break the trail. And so the sergeant's next command shot him forward, swift as an arrow. Get him, boy. Go get him. Faraday had found it impossible to reload and hang on at the same time. He called to his team to stop. Frantically, he jammed cartridges into the cylinder of the revolver. But just as he closed it and raised the gun to fire, King was on top of him. And a moment later, the sergeant was stopping his team beside them. All right, boy. I've got his gun. Get up, Faraday. Birch told me everything about your part in the 40-mile robbery. Your two gunmen will testify you tried to kill Bert. You're under arrest in the name of the Queen. That dog! I should have killed him when I had the chance. He'd never have got me if it hadn't been for him. That's true. He never forgot you, and it was he who saved Bert's life. You're right, Faraday. It's thanks to King this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's program. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are never sold in bags or bulk. No siree. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are never sold in bags or bulk. To get the original crisp, fresh cereal shot from guns, always look for the famous big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That's the only way to get the one and only Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Buy both kinds tomorrow. For variety, eat Quaker puffed wheat one day, Quaker puffed rice the next. Man, oh man, they're delicious. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the adventure of... Death on the Trail. This adventure began when King and I went to Dundee to help a friend who was accused of murder. It looked bad for Shorty Wilkins, but when someone tried to stop our investigation by shooting at King and me, I was sure he had been framed. How we went about clearing Shorty was an exciting case. Be sure to hear this exciting story Friday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pot Wheat and Quaker Pot Rice. So long. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.